Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for the latest in the HydroTerra webinar series. Today is our first of a new uh, focus in terms of our webinars. We have uh, what we're calling enabling change webinars. The uh, uh, Gavin, if you move to the next slide, please. Yep. So the people involved today that, and the purpose of these this new format is to bring in industry leaders that we identify who we think have uh, had a long career in a particular sector and also a successful career who have ideas on how various monitoring technologies could be applied to improve industry practice. So today we have Dr. Gavin Mudd presenting and I will uh, provide you with a bit more details on his uh, uh, career shortly. Um, next slide, thanks Gavin. Before we get started, just a few little things logistically. Um, if you want to ask a question during the uh, presentation, just use that Q&A button, which is depicted on your screen and type away. Really uh, success uh, in our minds from these presentations are lots of questions. Uh, we really are looking to share knowledge and collaborate to take the industry forward. So looking forward to getting plenty of questions from you. If we don't get through all of those questions today, we will uh, address them and send you an email response uh, soon after the uh, webinar. All right, next uh, slide, thanks, Kevin. So we've, this is sort of a program for the day. As I said, the themes about enabling change, I will run through the objectives of this uh, webinar in the next couple of slides. And then Gavin's going to take over and run through um, really a bit of a background on mine rehabilitation and his, his take on it. Um, some of the regulatory requirements around mine rehabilitation, but then most importantly, I suppose looking at the case studies of what has been successful, a lot of you may not be aware of what, what hasn't been successful and what's been truly ugly. Um, Gavin has some really strong ideas on uh, how we can improve, particularly around monitoring the success of mine rehabilitation and a portion of his presentation relates to that. One thing um, that uh, is emphasized in here is you know, community expectations around uh, mining. These days, uh, well, it used to be in the old days that the regulator really set the bar, but uh, certainly in more recent times, it is, is about community expectations. And that has, in some instances, got ahead of where the regulators are setting the bar. So it is interesting, this whole concept of license to, to operate, really. And um, Gavin touches on that as well in this presentation. The last part of this will be the Q&A uh, session where Michelle will be coordinating that for us, um, reading out your questions and Gavin and myself will do our best to answer them. Next slide, thanks Gavin. Okay, so what's HydroTerra hoping to achieve with these uh, enabling change series? Really, uh, what I'm seeing at the moment, you know, HydroTerra as a technology business that applies that, particularly in environmental monitoring, is an exponential change in the capacity for environmental monitoring, whether it's drones or satellites, sensors, telemetry and data analysis. But what often is the case in life is that technology um, the, the, the what can be enabled with technology takes a long time to be adopted. So what we would what we're hoping to do is to help to stimulate uh, and enable uh, through increased knowledge in the people watching these webinars and through showing through the ideas of these guest speakers how we can move forward more quickly as industries, really 
because uh, at the end of the day, adoption of these technologies will increase productivity and reduce environmental footprints because of the increased resolution in the state of play of a business at any point in time. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Gavin. So just to reiterate, we're hoping to stimulate thought on how rapidly changing capabilities of monitoring technologies can be applied in industry. And we believe that will facilitate operational efficiency and environmental impacts. We're hoping to combine technology knowledge and the wisdom of these long-term industry leaders to provide a bit of a stage to facilitate those sorts of discussions where we bring these things together. So this is really about trying to enable collaboration. Uh, next slide, thank you. So where's the wisdom coming from today? Well, Gavin is uh, presenting and he has a long and highly established career starting as an environmental engineer, graduating from RMIT back in 1995. Really his career has focused on mining pretty much the whole way through, but he did start with a PhD on coal ash impacts in the Latrobe Valley. Um, since then, he really has pursued a very successful academic career at the University of Queensland, Monash University, and now he's gone back home to his roots back at RMIT. Um, look, he has been at the forefront of environmental issues in mining for the last 25 years, with his research recognised as the most authoritative around the world. Collaborations that Gavin's been involved in include the US Geological Survey, Columbia University, Yale University, as well as across Europe and extensively in Australia. Uh, he has many publications and has uh, underpinning that a whole lot of unique data sets. Look, Gavin's uh, been very proactive working with the communities out there, including Indigenous communities. Um, he's had quite a lot of key focus on the uranium mining, but really has a very broad range of experience across mining. Uh, I would say Gavin is the most passionate person I have met around mine sites and mine site closure and their impact on the environment. And I'm looking forward to this presentation today. So over to you, Gavin, and thanks very much for being involved. No worries. Thank you, Richard. It's um, a pleasure to be able to contribute today. And uh, I guess I've got a, there's always a lot of detail that, that one can go to. And so what I want to achieve today is really, I suppose, a bird's eye view of, of the primary ideas. And, and I guess really the, the, the most simple idea is that you know, we're, we're told that we do mine rehabilitation and we're told that it's always successful. Um, and I think we can really challenge those two myths because uh, that doesn't always happen. Uh, but let alone, how do we really judge successful mine rehabilitation? And so I think the, the communities I'm working with, of course, are, uh, are dealing with sometimes quite polluting mines um, or they've heard those stories. And again, in the, in the digital age, uh, we can all hear these stories uh, much more easily now than we ever have before. So, so I think we do need to think differently about how we go about uh, demonstrating that we have done rehabilitation and then also uh, proving that it's been successful. And so to do that, we need the data, we need the monitoring. And so how do we bring all of those things together? And so uh, hopefully if uh, I can achieve some good thoughts or some good uh, discussion on that today, then uh, um, as I quote a good old spot, my job here is done. Now, this is a part of the world that's um, just outside the main flood zones, I think at the moment, but if you go west of the Sunshine Coast, there's a little spot just where this yellow circle is. Uh, that was a gold mine. Uh, if you go in, it's called the Agricola Gold Mine. Of course, Agricola was the old German scholar of mining back 500 years ago. Um, but you go into this area now, it, from 30 years ago when that mine operated, you can't find it. Uh, there's really uh, there's no obvious evidence that there was ever a gold mine there. Now, the Agricola gold mine operated for, for something like six months. There's no production records. It left an acid mine drainage disaster. There was a cyanide accident. Um, and one of the extremely rare cases where a government has stepped in and actually uh, closed a mine. Uh, and so then there was no bond. 
And so government has then had to uh, accept the liability of how to go about remediating that site. Now, you look at it now, and this is just using Google Earth, um, you can't find any evidence of that mine. So to me, that raises a question, and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd be interested to know um, how many people have ever heard of the Agricola gold mine, and it's certainly not a well-known story, but um, the point, is it a case of successful mine rehabilitation? And I think the answer to that is probably yes. But again, we have no data to prove that. And, and again, it's, it's one of the things that I guess we always have to think about. Um, and if we have no data, we can't say yes, we can't say no. All we can say is we have no data. But if we want to be able to say we're successful, we really need good data uh, to be able to back that claim up. And that's, that's called good science, good regulation and good policy. Um, and the communities that I've worked with over the years, uh, that's what they expect. And so uh, it's entirely reasonable. All right. And so this promise that we, we always do rehabilitation and it always works, those sort of two promises that, that have now been basically made for, for decades here in Australia, I guess that's really um, what a lot of communities are looking for is, well, where's the data to show that? So if you look at it from a broad point of view, and you can, can see here in, in this slide, the bottom photo is a, a much earlier photo of the Loyang open cut uh, down in the Latrobe Valley. So the, uh, the coal ash uh, tailings dam at the back here is where I did my PhD, looking at the seepage impacts on groundwater there. All right. And so normally, you know, we often hear agriculture has bigger impacts on the Australian landscape than mining. Uh, and I, I would often describe those as chronic. Sure, the land clearing was probably more of an acute phase, but mining as a, um, you know, when it does disturb land, it can be very acute. And especially when we're dealing with the large open cut mines that we see especially in the coal sector, but um, also in others. Now, we know also that there are many examples around Australia and around the world of, uh, of mine-related pollution, often related to processes such as uh, acid and metalliferous drainage, um, but also sometimes, with, especially with uranium or uh, other um, rare earth projects, for example, there can be radionuclides involved as well. All right? And so, you know, largely, when we think about what's happened over the last sort of, you know, recent decades, since the 1970s, uh, the part of the whole need for environmental regulation, uh, mining was certainly one part of the justification for that. Obviously, chemical factories, oil refineries, and other sort of heavy industry uh, and our air quality were also part of the reason we set up environmental regulation. But part of the, I suppose, the modern way that we deal with uh, uh, mining regulation is that we look at um, the need to rehabilitate so that there's some stable... Uh, post-mining land use, whatever that may be, uh, and that the site is not um, releasing uh, pollutants or, or contaminants out into the environment. Right? But one of the things I think the, the, the real problems we have is that most of our mines are actually still operating. There's actually very few um, that if you think about the way we should justify mine rehab as a stable or sustainable landscape had, which has some post-mining land use, We'd really need at least 10 years or more, I think, to, to verify that and, and to really demonstrate that the, the rehab is successful. And so if we start thinking about that, you need at least 10 years of, of rehabilitation, you know, after rehabilitation's finished and monitoring, um, yeah, and so on. And there's very few modern mines that have actually been closed and rehabilitated and were monitored for 10 years or more. All right. And so if we start thinking about it, and that's the way communities would think about it, and it's not unreasonable, it's entirely... Uh, rational to think about that because that's what the sort of uh, we know the nature of the processes and so on so so in some ways we don't have a huge database of, uh, of mines that have been actually you know arguably successfully rehabilitated um, there's elements that we could certainly look at like an overburden dump or a tailings dam um, but whole mine sites is something that we really haven't done a lot of yet but it's coming we know we've just closed the hazelwood mine here in victoria um, in a few years ago, we closed the Anglesey mine, um, and we know there's going to be a lot more mines closed in the in the, in the coming uh, you know, next 10, 20, 30 years than, uh, than what we've closed so far. So this problem is going to be a very big one and one we need to make sure we get right. So if we look at this, and I won't go through all of these, but, but again, a lot of this is the basics of mining. We have our, our type of mine, underground open cup, the waste rock dump or overburden dump, um, the tailings dams, maybe some water management ponds and um, the process plants or power stations, as it may be, in the Latrobe Valley. And so when we look at mine rehabilitation, we have to think about all of these aspects, whether it be the physical safety, uh, chemical safety, um, any remaining cyanide that may be present, 
um, say Victoria, maybe uh, arsenic issues or, um, you know, say mercury, for example. Um, for some sites, you may have to consider radionuclide issues or radiation issues. Um, but also, we have to understand that mining rehabilitation uh, has social uh, issues that we have to think about as well. Whether that's changes in the economic activity, the, uh, the workforce is uh, almost definitely going to be lower for mine rehabilitation than operations. So that changes the sort of social dynamics there as well. And so um, all of that has to be considered with where communities up to. And community have sort of what I would always argue are often reasonable expectations. And uh, and again, those expectations are often set on what's being promised to them. Right? And what's being promised um, is good success rates and the fact that rehabilitation is required or, and, and always done. Right? So in some ways, all communities are expecting uh, is exactly what industry and government have been uh, saying for the last 40, 50 years. Now, the way that this has um, come to be, there's uh, some of the main ways we think about the regulatory uh, process for mining and, and mine rehabilitation. Is there is a, a bond that's held, a financial bond? Right? But I think I, I really struggle to find a case where the actual cost of rehabilitation um, was less than the bond. Right. And uh, I know of many, many cases where the bond is uh, always far in excess of the actual bond that's held. Right. And so, and there's been the Victorian Auditor General's Office report recently looking at this in Victoria, but also in New South Wales and Victoria. And so these unfunded liabilities are, are looming large. And so, uh, so if we get this wrong, the potential liability to, to government and communities uh, and potentially the industry as well is, uh, is certainly uh, very, very large, potentially of the order of billions and billions of dollars. Uh, the exact legal requirements do vary depending on which jurisdiction you're in. Um, right, so there's always sort of nuance there, but, but basically it's these sort of expectations of making sure you've got physical safety, chemical safety, um, some kind of ecosystem or post mining land use. Right, and this has really been since the start of the, what used to be, of course, the Australian Mining Industry Council, uh, which takes a lot of people back, I'm assuming, but um, nowadays we call them the Minerals Council of Australia. And so since the 1970s, the annual conference has been very strongly themed around the environmental performance of the mining industry. And that has been changed more into sustainability language um, and a focus over the, um, the last 20 odd years. Uh, and so we can see some of the handbooks and the, the guidance that's produced uh, either by, by the industry, such as the MCA or by, um, by government, but such as the best practice environmental management series that was done in the 1990s. Um, and a decade later, we had the leading practice sustainable development handbooks um, developed for the, uh, for the industry and guidance in that way. So, and a lot of these really talk about you know, case studies of Kidston and many others, um, and some of the basic ideas that we use for mine rehabilitation. Now in Victoria, um, because of the issues in the Latrobe Valley and I suppose some of the, the concerns around the longer term potential liabilities there, uh, Earth Resources have now required annual rehabilitation reporting. And this is progressive. No other state does it in this way. Um, all right, this is a, a slightly older sort of screen capture, but, um, but again, this principle that we should be reporting publicly. Uh, these are effectively public resources that are being mined, so the, whether it be coal or gold, Right, so there is an expectation that um, the public interest is being protected. And especially when you're looking at the fact that a lot of these mines in places like the Latrobe Valley um, or elsewhere, we're not just talking about the, the closure and rehabilitation of one mine, we're talking about multiple. So cumulative impacts and therefore how that interacts with whether it be groundwater, surface water, um, the communities and uh, biodiversity and so on. And so I think um, getting better clarity, get a pub, getting better public transparency, I think is an important principle. So we're seeing elements of this. And I think that's one of the things I really want to highlight is that we know of all the elements out there. All right, so we know, um, you know that, uh, exactly the, the types of technologies and other things that could be directed to looking at all of this. So one of the, the biggest issues, I guess, I'm constantly uh, uh, arguing that we're certainly underestimating is acid and metalliferous drainage, or AKA, you know, acid mine drainage. And, you know, the, the simple geochemistry there, we take an iron sulfide, we expose that to water and oxygen in the surface, and we get our, our rust, our sulfuric acid, and our heat. All right, and so that, uh, that acid then in turn dissolves up heavy metals and salts and so on. And so, um, and it's a pervasive problem. It's a pervasive problem in the iron ore industry, in the coal, gold, copper, lead, zinc, nickel, etc. Right, it's, um, it's an issue that I think is still being uh, very significantly underestimated across Australia, right? And so, 
um, we know, and, and especially if you go back to Agricola's time in, uh, in the state of Saxony, uh, which is now part of Germany, he was documenting acid mine drainage problems in the uh, Urgeburger, the, the Ore Mountains region, which is the basically the divider between the um, eastern side of Germany and the, what we now say is the, the Czech Republic. Right, so this is a long-term problem um, and something that we've known about for a while, I guess. But again, I think the difference these days is we're not just talking about small silver mines in Saxony, we're talking about large-scale mines like Hazelwood and many others. And so that scale is fundamentally uh, much, much larger. So let's talk about some case studies. And I think Red Bank, um, and I don't know if anyone can actually point to where Red Bank is on a map. It's pretty obscure. It's in the, the Gulf country, literally uh, right near the uh, Northern Territory Queensland border, right, about 20 k's across into the Northern Territory side. And it's a really, really small mine, about two and a half million tonnes of mine waste. And we can see here, you can see the, the active flow of acid mine drainage coming down. So this is the waste rock dump behind us here. This mine was opened in the 1990s, went bankrupt after two years, and there was no bond, despite the fact there was a legal requirement for a bond. All right, so we can see all the, the copper precipitating out um, you know, through here, so there's nice sort of aqua blue colours. This is industrial grade solution in Hanrahan's Creek. This is about pH 3 or so, uh, and not pH 4, uh, but you're dealing with 350 milligrams per litre of copper and 375 milligrams per litre of aluminium. Right, so almost in effectively industrial grade solutions, but from the waste rock dump near the open cut there, you've got all the water table completely polluted by the acid mine drainage and the open cut is acting as a sink. And so it draws all of that groundwater, um, contaminated groundwater in. Right, it's quite a remarkable site. I've never seen that anywhere else. And so uh, if you go down Hanrahan's Creek and follow it, the, uh, the creek system, um, especially all the way down to Surprise Creek, and you can still find um, the wetlands on the coast about on the, in, the, in the Queensland side on the Gulf Country uh, sitting at about 50 micrograms per litre copper. So still extremely significant copper concentrations despite all that dilution. So, so for a really, really small amount of mine waste, uh, you've killed an entire river system of Hanrahan's Creek and severe impacts on Surprise Creek. So it's uh, quite remarkable that we've been able to achieve that with a mine that only operated for, for two years. Now, if we look at, I suppose, the, the more local example for Victoria, we've got the Latrobe Valley down here. And so we've got the three major sort of coal mining and power station complexes. So we've got Loyang over on the right-hand side here and the, the, the more regional view, uh, your lawn up the top here, and that's now announced it'll be closing in 2028, uh, a few years earlier than, uh, than uh, previously expected. Uh, and then uh, Hazelwood or Moorwell, as uh, a lot of us more affectionately remember it as. All right, we can see this, the sheer vast area. And one of the things to remember um, is this is about 1.5 SID hubs worth of volume. A SID hub is uh, what we uh, often call um, a, a volume of Sydney Harbour. Right? So Sydney Harbour is approximately 500 million cubic metres. And so uh, Hazelwood is 1.5 times that at about 750 million uh, cubic metres. Uh, and I think uh, from the studies that have been done, your lawn's probably sitting somewhere similar to that by the time it finishes and Loyang will be uh, uh, bigger than that. So these are huge features. We can't backfill them. The more coal has come out volumetrically than the, than the overburden. Um, but we need to think about not only just the rehabilitation of Hazelwood, but what that means in terms of the whole cumulative rehabilitation of the whole valley. All right? And in the Trove Valley, we've only got three um, major coal mining complexes in uh, places like the Hunter Valley, the Bowen Basin and so on, you've got uh, dozens upon dozens upon dozens. So the, uh, the complexity there gets uh, you know, much higher. Right? And so there's work going on here, um, but the bond at the time this was closed was $70 million. And yet the uh, estimated cost was at the very least 750 million. Right? So that's sort of showing that our bonds were a significant shortfall compared to what the actual cost is. Now, I think NG, I think deserve credit. They've certainly been um, continuing to, to fund the works there, um, as Alcoa are doing down at Anglesey as well. So, so I think it, just because the bond is short doesn't automatically mean it's going to be a disaster, um, but there is that risk there. And certainly from a community point of view, that is something that uh, is, is of concern. If we look at a, another story, and I, I think one of the ones that uh, I think, if we look at the modern mining era, as I mentioned, there's very few mines that have been turned off, rehabilitated, and then monitored. So Kingston is one of the very few that does meet that, uh, you know, that, those sort of basic criteria. 
and it was identified towards the end of its operations in the 90s as being uh, at a significant risk of acid mine drainage or AMD. And so they, uh, um, plus a dome, the company that operated uh, Kingston for its, its life, uh, invested a lot in research and development around looking at the, the design of soil covers over the tailing stand. So this sort of structure on the bottom here, you see the old tailing stand, it's a you know, standard upstream type structure. We can see the waste rock dumps, the old pits, some tailings inside the uh, Wises pit as well. Uh, and so the waste rock dumps around here. And along the, um, here you can see the Copperfield River. Right, and so it was rehabilitated in the early 2000s. Um, and we can see on the, on the right hand side here, um, this is from the environmental assessment work um, that was uh, put forward to justify converting the old Kingston mine into a pumped hydro, um, basically energy storage scheme. Right, and so um, the unique characteristics of the different depths between the two pits allows the potential for pumped hydro. And so as part of that, there was an assessment of the water quality and the risks of disturbing all of that, uh, of that water uh, and the potential risks around AMD and so on as well. And so we can see the, the point here, W2, this is the point basically where you've got the main drainage coming out from all the old mine works. We're getting up to a thousand milligrams per litre almost, or several hundred milligrams per litre of sulphate. Right, that's pretty high, you know, and so we can see if you're looking at uh, the background, um, you're looking at sort of numbers like one, somewhere between one to 10 milligrams per litre upstream. So, so certainly there's still an A and B problem there. Uh, it's certainly reducing over time and getting closer to sort of background, right? But it certainly suggests that there's still, um, you know, solutes uh, leaving that site and getting into the Copperfield River, right? And so whether it's a big success story and I suppose the disturbance that's now being uh, uh, undertaken to convert the old mine into a pump hydro storage scheme, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But it's certainly a very unique site in that way, kids. Another site that probably most people have forgotten about, and I, I did have the, the opportunity uh, to get down there um, about five or six years ago. It's about an hour southeast of uh, Canberra, near not far from Queanbeyan. Uh, and this is an old mine, a small um, volcanic massive sulphide deposit that was mined for just over 20 years in the 1940s and 1950s. But uh, an early uh, tailing sand failure in the early 70s sent polluted water right through to, to Lake Burley Griffin in Canberra. And so they went in and did some remediation work. So we can see on the hill just behind here, that's the old tailing stand cells. So we can see some areas of bare soil and whether that's salt scarring or something, I'm not sure, but we can certainly see this acid mine drainage coming out from the, uh, the, the toe drain at the, um, right, basically seepage interception drain at the toe of the dam here. Right. And so if you're looking at the Malongo River in the middle here, uh, we can certainly see that there's evidence of uh, A and D coming out of the old underground um, drainage pipes, uh, but the, the Malongo River is certainly doesn't seem to be a heavily impacted river um, compared to, say, Hanrahan's Creek. So but clearly the remediation works have reduced the amount of acid mine drainage getting out into the site. And so, yeah, arguably, uh, you know, reasonably successful to a point. Um, and this is after about 25 years of, um, or no, 35 years, sorry, of uh, rehabilitation. So again, one of the very, very few um, small examples, I guess, we've got. But, but again, we need to extrapolate over scales of, of decades to centuries to really be confident about that. So out of all of that, what do I think um, that means? I think at the moment, um, there is still no consistency on the way that um, we can get access to the data and the monitoring of uh, you know, operating mines, let alone mine rehabilitation. And often once we go into mine rehabilitation, um, there's even less you know, justification in some ways for that people feel the need to uh, you know, keep reporting. But I think in many ways, it's actually even more important during you know, rehabilitation, All right? And so in uh, New South Wales, for example, companies are required to make their annual environmental management reports public. And so that means that all of the statutory conditions around groundwater, surface water, noise, biodiversity, dust, et cetera, all of that has to be documented in their annual report and that report made public. Right. So at the moment, it's uh, New South Wales and South Australia that do that, but we, we don't do that here in Victoria, for example. All right. And so, but again, we, we know of many other systems where we've got data um, uh, you know, databases for climate, for, for water resources, whether it be surface water or groundwater, uh, we've got databases for mines. We, uh, I guess the Bureau of Meteorology's website would be working overtime lately, um, basic rainfall data and so on. But you can look at it in completely different areas like stock markets and so on. But we don't do this for mine rehabilitation. And that's something that I think if we did, 
we would have much more confidence in understanding not only how much mine rehabilitation um, actually does proceed, but also how successful it is. Right? Because if we're thinking about processes, whether it be acid mine drainage, erosion, ecosystem reestablishment, they may take uh, years to decades or sometimes even centuries to, to work through. Right? And so we're dealing with modern mines that are dealing with billions and billions of tonnes of, uh, of mine waste. So we're not just dealing with small sites like Red Bank, which was just in some ways a paltry 2.5 million tonnes, but managing to destroy a river system like uh, Mount Lyell or uh, Mount Morgan has, right? but uh, we're dealing with much, much larger systems, much, much larger mines. And so that scale um, of, of mine rehab is therefore much, much larger, but also the community concern is therefore much larger. And so that's what drives a lot of community concern around either existing mines or new mines, um, and especially that issue around social license to operate. And you know, most communities I've worked with and engage with, um, if you give them good data to address an issue, they'll acknowledge that accordingly. Um, but for some people, they say, well, we just don't want mining in this patch. It's, it's, uh, it's for um, vineyards, it's for uh, farming or whatever. Uh, and that's a choice, that's fine. Um, and I suppose governments then have to make the choice of um, whether they approve a mine in that context or not. Right? So I think when we're thinking about it, we need much better ways to be able to look at how we verify the success of mine rehabilitation. And I think that hopefully the key point is that while we already have analogues out there, we already have the types of systems that we could use, we just need to apply them and, uh, and, and link all of the various technologies and monitoring, et cetera, together. So as an example, I just sort of put a few different sort of screen captures here. And so what we can see is the Australian Mines Atlas, which is a system that um, Geoscience Australia run, which is due to be replaced pretty soon. Uh, in Victoria, and, and, and Victoria, I think, has always been a great leader in this space, is uh, WIMIS, or the Water Monitoring Information System. Uh, so that's a, a great database of uh, surface water and, uh, and groundwater data. We also have uh, Visualising Victoria's Groundwater, the, the system developed by uh, FedUni uh, to basically facilitate better visualisation of, of groundwater information and data. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a wonderful interface to be able to really explore uh, groundwater uh, and so on, and then also the um, the reports and other things behind that. So I think it's a, a really it's a fantastic example of what can be done with uh, with modern technology and uh, and thinking. On the left hand side here is things like the uh, the, the Queensland Globe, where they've used uh, they've developed basically an interface that allows Queensland to uh, look at a whole range of different aspects. Now it was developed largely to address community concern around coal seam gas and the, the impacts on groundwater. Um, and in some ways, that would be my, my argument up there for many years when I was uh, looking at coal seam gas issues, is that uh, there's, the, the data is was held private, need to be made public, right? And so certainly companies like Santos and Origin have now developed their own, like Santos have their own water portal, which also does the same kind of thing as these types of systems. And so, um, but again, that's fine during operation, but we're still not doing it for, for rehabilitation. Now, I guess some of the more recent work that I've been doing to try and sort of you know, get to the numbers behind a lot of this is my own database. So my own, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, dots on the map where there's been a mine, where there's a, a tailing dam, a waste rock dump or, or heat leach facility and things like that. And so this is work I've literally just about finished now and will be uh, hopefully getting published pretty soon. And so that way I have not only just the, the quantity of tailings, uh, but I'll be looking at, um, using this for looking at rehabilitation, uh, and potentially, is it worth reprocessing tailings to get residual metals out or critical metals, like stuff that's important for, for modern technology and so on? All right. So eventually, this will be public and um, and um, and so on. So uh, I suppose if people are interested, then uh, yeah, stay in touch. So out of all of that, it's uh, probably time to, to finish up now. But um, we need better systems. We need a much more public approach in how we really verify. Uh, one, the extent of mine rehabilitation, but also data on which to judge success. Right? And I think that principle of transparency is fundamental. Communities really expect it. Uh, and that's fair. Like I think we've been told for decades that we have mine rehabilitation and it's successful. And yes, okay, there are some examples out there and there's probably more than we realise, but there's also a lot of examples out there where we have rehabilitation hasn't been done uh, or it hasn't been um, as successful as hoped. Right, and uh, there's Rum Jungle, there's Mount Todd, there's many others I could name. Uh, and hence, once I've finished my little database work, that list will be complete. Right. 
And a lot of the issues in thinking about how to do that is the standard stuff we've been doing for, for some decades now in contaminated land assessment, uh, environmental monitoring and so on, uh, chain of custody, the quality control issues, like the ownership and management of these systems. Right? Uh, and again, but also looking at how we integrate various aspects. In some ways, mine rehabilitation is more complex. We're not just dealing about water. We're not just dealing about climate. We're looking at uh, all aspects. And so, um, so again, and the GIS architecture that we uh, we need. And, and again, but this stuff we've already addressed. We already have the various technologies out there. And so examples like Windows and VVG uh, and others already address a lot of this. All right. And so I think in a lot of ways, that there's, I don't think I don't see these issues as barriers. Uh, could we've, we've dealt with these in many of the existing systems we have. All right? And so, and again, one of the things that I think we need to work out is how long do we monitor for? If you look at the MacArthur River uh, zinc mine up in the Northern Territory, when it went through its most recent environmental impact assessment, it said it needs to be monitoring rehabilitation for 1,000 years. And that's given that site, which is an extremely high risk site in terms of acid mine drainage. The Ranger Uranium Mine, for example, is required to demonstrate no impacts from solutes from its tailings for 10,000 years. Right, and that's an intellectual uh, challenge, I guess, in groundwater, but um, it's a high bar. It sets an extremely high standard, I guess, on how we think about rehabilitation there. Right? But also the, the funding systems really need to match that. A lot of the bonds that we have really only deal with the actual engineering works, the, uh, the rehabilitation works themselves. There's uh, really not as much focus on how we fund long-term monitoring. And also, if there is something that goes wrong, how we fund future remediation efforts or maintenance efforts. Right? And that's something that I think industry, government and community are we're all struggling to work out how that, uh, how that needs to look. Right? There's ideas out there, but I think we, uh, at the moment, I certainly don't see any good ideas that are, are already in place to, that do that well. And even at Ranger, we're still struggling on uh, how to actually make that happen. So all of that means that we have this great opportunity because uh, I don't see anywhere else in the world that's really doing this yet either. So uh, I think Australia, we could uh, really develop this approach and, um, and really make sure we're demonstrating you know, not only that we are doing mine re rehabilitation, but that we're having good success. And then that will also have uh, great value uh, in, in, for communities, but also for the industry and government in terms of understanding liability and, and making sure that we are, are not leaving problems for future generations. But that communities can say, right, actually, yeah, okay, we, we can now believe these claims. There's good evidence for it. There's good monitoring data. Um, we are having good success. And so that will help um, reinforce, I suppose, a, a social license to operate um, and add great value that way. Let alone, I guess, the other sort of um, imperative of, of actually doing a good job in the first place. So, um, yeah, that's it for now. I'm happy to open it up for questions. So just the contact details there. So, but again, thanks to, to Richard and Michelle and, um, yeah, let's get stuck into Q&A. Well, thanks very much, um, Gavin, for that. Just before we hand over to Michelle, I'd like to say that uh, it's always impressive having a uh, someone who's devoted their whole career to a particular sector, and I thought the depth of knowledge around this topic was excellent. Um, so over to you, Michelle, to run the Q&A. Please uh, remember to, to log your questions into that Q&A box um, and over to you, Michelle. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Gavin. Um, let's, we have two questions at the moment. Uh, let's start with the first one. How do you think we can make rehabilitation reporting more streamlined when there are many organizations and regulators involved? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll give some thoughts, and I know Richard will have some extra thoughts there as well. But um, in some ways, it's doing what we already do. Uh, there's a lot of requirements um, for a mine that's undergoing rehabilitation to monitor and assess for uh, biodiversity, whether that be vegetation structure, um, erosion, or uh, surface water monitoring, groundwater monitoring. So a lot of that data uh, exists. And I think part of the problem is that it's not being made public. Now, sometimes it's a very simple thing. The, re the reports are prepared. Um, so just making those reports available on a website, that can be one way to do it. Uh, and um, an another way to do it uh, is to look at the databases there and looking at the, the ways to sort of make that available. Now, given the, the nature of things, uh, there's great value, I think, in making those databases public. All right? Now, I understand there's, there's uh, I suppose, sometimes sensitivity around that. 
uh, and sometimes a lot of commercial knowledge or um, you know, and costs associated with that. But I, hopefully, I think I've made the case that there's also a lot of great value, both scientific value uh, as well as community value and regulatory value in uh, making that public. And I suppose that's one of the, the questions that um, I think we need to work through is should that database be sort of run by um, a, a government regulator um, or department? Um, you know, or should it be um, run by uh, um, the mining company itself? All right. So there are certainly examples um, in New Zealand, like the old Golden Cross mine, uh, where the neighbouring Waihi mine um, manages that. And so all of the monitoring data around the rehabilitation of Golden Cross uh, is basically managed by another mining company on behalf of the uh, uh, provincial government there in, around Waikato. So, um, so there are different examples around the world, but it's. Um, uh, but I think, yeah, I, I know. I hand over to Richard for some extra thoughts as well. Yeah, thanks, Gavin. Look, my main thought is that the question was around streamlining reporting. I think often we focus on environmental compliance metrics, you know, concentrations of elements, etc., and we we disregard the performance of the structures that we've designed to minimise the risk of the impacts on the environment. So, I think as an industry, it would be good for us to start focusing in on the performance of the actual structures and whether it's you know pumping or covers or a whole lot of things to which actually are the main mechanism that's been chosen to protect the environment um, they can have triggers on them so we get very timely action on that often environmental monitoring um, is periodic based on um, lab analysis whereas you can have continuous monitoring on built structures to really alert you very quickly to a failure in a in a whole range of different engineered structures. So I'd like to see more thought into compliance around the performance of the sort of mitigation measures rather than so much on the environment itself. Yeah, I mean, just another final thought, I guess, on the, the I suppose the aspect of streamlining it, it and sometimes it's um I mean, reward for effort, I think, is probably a good way to think about that. Is that yes, there is a bit of effort in translating or getting it from internally inside a company to that public system, whatever that system becomes. Um, absolutely. But, uh, but I think the other way to think about that is there's a lot of reward for that as well. And not just to the company, but to the regulator, to the community, um, as well as to the sort of the broader um, you know, body of science that we need to be able to bring to bear to, to really assess mine rehab. So... So I think, um, and I guess to me that's, you know, I've got an open mind at the moment as to exactly how we, what type of systems and how we start to do that. Uh, but I think, we're, yeah, we do need to be efficient, but I think we shouldn't be afraid of actually saying it's going to take a, you know, an extra, uh, you know, 3% or 5% on someone's workload and we need to work out how to sort of resource that um, without actually thinking about actually the value that we're creating from that extra effort. And so I think, yeah, so hopefully that helps in, um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Let's go to the second question. Does MUD MIGA database include legacy mine site or just operating mines? Does it also include queries? Okay, great, great question. Um, it includes some old mines, but most of the mines I've put on my map are the, are the last 50 odd years. Now, some mines, you know, Broken Hill, Mount Lyle, and, and others, of course, you know, long predate that, and they're there, of course. Um, but the, uh, and often a lot of what I've got there is the fields, right? So I've got Bendigo Gold Field rather than all of the individual mines that used to exist on the old Bendigo Gold Field, right? So, um, and I think to, to verify that, I think it's beyond, you know, what anyone's really capable of at the moment. And I don't know if we'll ever be capable of doing that. So we know that there, there used to be you know, dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of mines, specifically around Bendigo itself. Right? So um, validating all of those, I think, would be, yeah, it'd be tricky. But certainly for quarries, um, at the moment, I don't. That's something I, I've got other work in progress at the moment where we're, I'm looking at some quarries, again, with a few different communities. Um, and so quarries is an area that it's uh, underestimated. And I, and I think there's certainly... Um, you know, I think there's the, the typical view that quarries are really low risk. They're just hard rock only. Um, and so, you know, we don't have the sort of acid mine drainage risks or chemical risks like uh, cyanide or mercury or arsenic um, and so on. But 
Uh, if you've got a limestone quarry, you can have very significant impacts on groundwater. If you've got a sand quarry, same sort of thing. If you've got a hard rock quarry, uh, you're probably more worried about uh, dust, noise, and blasting, right? And so rather than sort of groundwater issues, but uh, with quarries, of course, they're often very close to communities or very close to houses. And so um, how we manage all of that is, is really critical. But quarries, uh, I think, because they're often considered the distant poor cousin of mining, um, they often get a lot less attention. But that is certainly something I'd like to do. And it's something I've, I've certainly got some work in progress at the moment, just looking at Victoria. But um, again, there's no real consistency on how you classify quarries nationally. And so trying to come up with a nationally consistent database on that would be, yeah, require a lot of effort. But that, that's certainly a great idea and there's certainly a great need for that as well. But yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Um, Zihan Wang, say hi, Gavin, great talk. Thanks, Zihan. Next one, um, I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong. Uh, Shirunjit Kumasaka. Hi, Gavin. Um, I'm a PhD student at RMIT University. I have recently started my PhD study and working on a PhD research project jointly funded by RMIT and CSRO. I am working on a tailing storage facilities management in Australia, and I will evaluate tech tech technical economic facility of recovering critical minerals from old tailings. I am wondering if there is any database for tangling storage facilities in Australia. Um, the simple answer is mine. No one else has done it. Like I, I think that, so yes, there is, it's mine. That's what I'm sort of working on. I've um, just chasing down a few loose ends at the moment and then I'll be able to write that up and um, submit that. And that's certainly the work that um, we'll be collaborating on with Geoscience Australia because at the moment I've got the sort of the tons that are there and I've sort of the, the grades that you could expect roughly for the primary metals and I guess we're all interested in to work out um, what else might be present within those tailings, and that requires a lot more geochemical work. Uh, and I, I guess that's the next you know, big phase of that sort of research is to take that uh, into that space. But yeah, drop me a line, and we'll, I'm happy to um, collaborate and help out. Thank you. Next one, Mike Lintos. What are the metrics you would use to demonstrate rehabilitation success? I think a lot of those are sort of the broad categories uh, I would, uh, you know, sort of talking through. Like you've got surface water quality. So we have standards for surface water quality, the, the, the ANZEC guidelines. Uh, we can use those for groundwater in various ways too, um, allowing for, the, the, I suppose, the, the use categories or the um, uh, that we have for groundwater. And again, that will vary depending on what state you're in. But um, in the same sense that we look at, um, you know, metrics for uh, biodiversity. A really good example for the biodiversity metrics would be the Darling Range in uh, Western Australia, where they've been mining bauxite I suppose, since the, in the 1960s. And so Alcoa there especially has been very careful to look at, to measure the biodiversity metrics uh, and look at the, the species composition and, and, and the vegetation structure, you know, of, uh, you know, before mining, they then mine for the bauxite and then re-establish an ecosystem there. And then they, uh, and they reckon it takes somewhere between about five to 10 years to get back to a lot of those same metrics. All right, and so they can show that you're achieving those same biodiversity metrics within about five to 10 years. Now, one of the subtle details in that, of course, is trees that are, are say 500 years old, or um, you can't achieve that obviously within five to 10 years of rehabilitation. So there's certainly some aspects or some metrics that you could consider um, that you know, just can't be captured. And there is that long-term impact there. Right, so, um, so a lot of those, and, and depending on the mine and the context, uh, you know, the, the Darling Range, of course, has had to deal with cinnamon fungus, right, or Phytophthora cinnamoni, um, and so that's been a big issue during operations. Um, so we've got specific sort of criteria there. Um, but then also you've got other areas. If you're looking at um, the, the gold fields in Western Australia, you're in a, a hyper-arid climate, uh, and so the, the, the criteria might be very, very different. They're not so much surface water, as you might be about groundwater or, uh, or vegetation structure. I think that that's why I always sort of keep that fairly open because the, the exact metrics will vary, all right? um, but the, the, the basic ideas I think are there. Now, if you look at another example, which I, I didn't have time to go through today, would be uh, Tabletop, which is a, an old gold mine that operated in the, the 80s and 90s up near Croydon, um, which is a pretty remote part of Queensland, but it's on the, in the you know, not far away from um, uh, Normanton, I guess, in the in um, 
and Karumba there in, uh, in Queensland in, near the Gulf Country. And so that mine was closed in the, you know, the early 90s, mid 90s. Um, and you come back now and uh, there's no visual indicators of acid mine drainage and yet the pH is 3.5 in the, in the pond draining the open cuts or one of the open cuts I should. All right, and so there's clearly a, a risk there that uh, was underestimated at the, um, <clears throat> at the time of rehabilitation. So, so I think when we're looking at these things, there's lots of metrics that we can think about um, and a lot of them will vary according to the mine and um, you know, the type of deposit that it is, um, you know, how it was mined and managed uh, and so on. So there's lots of potential metrics out there. Uh, and again, some of these are included into a regulatory criteria, um, but then there's, uh, I think when we think about the community, you know, perspective on a lot of these things as well, actually they, they tend to keep it pretty simple is they want the stuff to be safe. You know, they don't want to have to constantly worry about it and, and so on. That, or if there is a need to, you know, kind of constantly monitor and maintain the site, um, then that needs to be addressed. And we need to work out how to fund and resource that so that that's achieved and we can maintain site safety uh, and, and so on. And so that's something that I think we've, still, yeah, and depending on the nature of the site will depend on the extent to which we need to do that. But there are certainly some sites like MacArthur River um, or Ranger where we really do need to uh, think very hard about how we do that. Yeah, hopefully that helps. And, uh, Gavin, if I could just add to that. Yeah, go for it. One, one of the um, pieces of the puzzle that is missing in a lot of sites is there's often a lot of detailed analysis done at sort of the environmental impact start of uh, a mine, but then the, the matching up of that against the actual environmental monitoring plan and, more importantly, the reporting side against that is often where there's more thought required. And I think that's one area where technology has now enabled us to be able to do a lot more analysis. So to get specific, for example, you know, on, on a project we're designing at the moment, we've been asked to look at sort of catchment health indicators, which rely on a whole bunch of different parameters to be measured and go through various algorithms to come up with that health ranking. But that can then be visualized spatially as well. So there is an opportunity to improve and create simplified indicators of um, success of rehabilitation where the, the, obviously the devil's in the detail that sits under that. But I think at the moment, um, a lot of the work I see around mining, we have a lot of monitoring going on, but often the reporting is perhaps more complex than it needs to be. And there needs to be more thought in how it is simplified to those metrics that um, are really important to community. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of a, a point I often make as well, actually, is that we do rarely ever actually check how accurate our prediction of impacts were from the environmental impact statement. And, and a really good example of that is uh, is Mount Todd. And Mount Todd went bankrupt twice and twice with no bond and has got a pit lake with 13 gigalitres of pH2 water. So it's been a disaster in terms of mine rehab. But at the time the project was approved in the 1990s, uh, one of the, the, the really heartfelt concerns was the risks to the Gouldy and Finch. Now, this is up near Catherine um, in the Northern Territory. And so the, the um, Gouldy and Finch is an endangered bird. It's a beautiful colored little bird. Um, and yet uh, about 15 years after the mine had gone bankrupt twice, there was one of the local bird um, societies, amateur um, scientists, I guess, or you know, um, citizen science, uh, actually did a survey of all the Gouldian features uh, you know, in the area near the old Mount Todd mine. And uh, they were able to show that they're actually in much better health and um, you know, there's more of them than what there was prior to the mine starting. So, so concerns around the mine you know, potentially leading to the extinction of the Gouldian finch have proven to be wrong or unfounded. Right? And so now there's other problems with Mount Todd that were completely underestimated, um, i.e. acid mine drainage. Right? But... Um, so I think linking that back in, I think is also another really, really important, important part of the overall process when we're thinking about not only just mine operations, but especially when we're thinking about mine rehabilitation, because taking mine rehabilitation back to where it started from, i.e. before the mine was there, if we can do that, um, I think that's often a, a really good way to, um, that we can approach it scientifically, but it's also often the way communities approach it as well. Okay, thank you guys. We have only five more minutes to answer nine questions. Now, if we cannot answer your questions, uh, probably um, Gavin and Richard will reach you and clarify the question for you. Okay, next one. 
Zinham Wang is successful mine rehab an essential part of improve the tailing dam safety, given BHP is facing a potential 9 billion bill for San Marco dam disaster. Yeah, there's no aspect of mine rehab that often um, doesn't get a lot of uh, exposure, I guess, or, or thought, but um, we have to monitor these structures in perpetuity, effectively, because we're, um, unless we're proposing to dig up the tailings and put it back into the pit where we don't have any physical structure to monitor, uh, and that does happen, it's, it's planned to happen at MacArthur River, it's uh, being done at Ranger, done at Woodcutters and, and, and a, you know, a bunch of other mines, but uh, we don't know how to, how to really do that yet, I think, uh, or we're not doing it well yet, I guess. And certainly Bormadinho is an example of that, where that um, tailing dam had already been uh, uh, stopped being used and it was in the process of waiting to be decommissioned. Um, and they knew that um, Bormadinho was uh, metastable, uh, but they ignored the warning signs and, uh, and assumed that they would eventually get around to remediating that dam and removing them, reprocessing the tailings, and then uh, put it into a new dam, which was more stable. Uh, unfortunately, um, I suppose history got to them first. But um, so I think it's, it's a big question that how we um, how we factor in the, the monitoring of that. I think some of the simple ideas that um, engineers I know in various mining companies we can sit down and go, let's put a hundred million dollars aside at a one percent interest rate. You've got one million dollars a year for monitoring. All right now we can argue about whether you need one million dollars or whether it has to be a hundred million or fifty million, um, and whether you assume a higher interest rate and uh, all of those sorts of numbers, but the basic principle is let's put aside a pot of cash that's held in some kind of bond um, and so on, and the, you move off the interest. And so that way you're, the interest is what's always paying for that monitoring and that. Um, and then every now and then, if you've got, a, you know, like the floods that we're seeing now uh, in Eastern Australia, if you've got a really big event that goes through that means you need to go in and do some maintenance works, you've got a bit of extra cash there to be able to use that for as well. So I think there's there's, there's potential ideas there, and certainly, you know, the engineers that I know, um, that their job was to, to stop failures like Samarco or Brumadinho, uh, and they worked, they didn't work for BHP, I, I should say, but um, we could sit down and agree that we, we, we all need some kind of process like that. We all need some kind of system that deals with the long-term integrity of tailing stands. Um, but regulators and companies don't want to go there yet. Now, maybe in a post Samarco, post, post Brumadinho world, yeah, maybe we finally will get there. But uh, from what I'm seeing out there in the trailing space, um, yeah, we've, that, that's a, a journey that we're, we're, we're still on and I think we're we'll to go. But you know, any extra thoughts on that, Richard? Uh, yeah, look, I just think there's some good examples out there where uh, pooled funds are used, you know, in the contaminated site area. The super fund in the US is one that might yep. be worth looking at. I do think it's about... Uh, pooling resources it's a bit like an insurance concept in a way and um, uh, it, it's uh, it's important to have that as a as a secondary thing to an estimate of you know bond value required at the individual mine because we don't seem to be getting that right at the moment based on what you've uh, sort of put forward you know like that 10 percent around uh, Hazelwood for example so um, pooled resources and um, sharing the sharing the risk to allow this long term monitoring would make sense in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Next one is Steve Cody. I have seen several mines that I parked, not operating and not rehab. It is uneconomic to operate and cheaper to maintain the license. How best are the risks, etc., managed in these circumstances? The care and maintenance phase is a big issue and I think typically what we see out there is that mines do get closed and then converted to care and maintenance because there's a, a hope that uh, the mine may be able to reopen at some point in the future if there's better prices or more exploration extends the ore deposit or, or whatever it happens to be. But um, And at some point, and I, and I think this is the point the Northern Territory got to with Red Bank, is there had been effectively 20 years of uh, hope for Red Bank reopening. Um, so 20 years of pollution. And so eventually the Northern Territory government said, no, nah, we're cancelling the lease and calling it in. And, uh, and it's now treated as an abandoned mine and the mining legacy fund that they have in the Northern Territory. So I think that's a sort of kind of fund that Richard was talking about as well, like essentially pooled fund, like a 1% levy on mines in the Northern Territory 
to help fund this uh, this uh, clean up and remediation of abandoned mines like Red Bank. Uh, and that's good policy. I, I remember thanking the, the senior regulator that helped implement that um, up in Darwin and a fellow by the name of Russell Ball, who deserves enormous credit for getting that policy up. So I think at some point we need to make decisions about uh, how important rehabilitation is to proceed now. There's the, the hope that a mine may eventually reopen uh, and that the ability to make that decision, I think, um, shouldn't just be made on the fact that well, we're always going to hope that a mine can reopen, uh, because sometimes they never do. Mount Morgan has been closed for over 30 years and it's still never reopened again. All right? And so um, you know, Mount Lyle has been closed for several years and it may or may not open again. All right? And so I think you could go through. I think that, that the way that we use care and maintenance to delay rehabilitation funding, I think we need to be very careful about that. There's certainly good examples where companies have not been able to sell like uh, Goldsworthy in Western Australia, where BHP was not allowed to sell. Um, and then they, they were, had to go in and spend the money on rehabilitation and then actually fix that site like they promised they were going to do all right, and were legally required to do, all right, rather than uh, selling it on to a junior company. All right, so I think that that's something that I think from a public policy point of view, we, we really do need to think hard about because at the moment, there is too much emphasis, I think, on actually, well, the hope the mine can reopen. Now, Sometimes you have a context where the risks are low and that's not, not necessarily uh, a bad outcome. Like that can still be a good outcome uh, and not a high risk outcome in terms of environmental problems. But you can get sites like Red Bank where that care and maintenance phase um, and the mine's closed and the, you know, there is an eventual hope that it might reopen. But I think we need to be, I suppose, a lot more hard nosed about that. And if we do rehabilitation and then there's more oil discovered later, uh, and that makes it more expensive to open and uneconomic, then it's uneconomic, you know, and, you know, a better future or better market or something else arrives. So, but there's, um, I would like to acknowledge the work of Mia Pepper in, in that space. She's actually done some recent research looking at care, the, the whole process of care and maintenance versus rehabilitation in Western Australia. So if people are interested, I can uh, certainly, um, yeah, send through her master's thesis on that. Anyway, hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. Do you, Gavin, Richard, do you have five more minutes to a few questions? We still have seven. Uh, yeah, I think we could probably give five more minutes. Uh, if sure. You want to. Okay, be... so... Yeah, I can fit that in. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, the next one is related to the previous. Uh, Keith Osborne. Given the failure of bonds to cover the long-term issues, could there be a mining levy that goes into a centralized funding body like US Super, Super Fund to underpin long-term funding for abandoned mine rehab? I think we should look at something like that. Now, Western Australia has kind of gone down that model to an extent where they have a one big central fund that all bonds get paid into uh, and then, but the problem at the moment with Western Australia is you only pay an annual fee, right? You don't pay a significant fraction of the total cost, whether that be 50% or even 100% of the total estimated cost of rehabilitation. And then the company is legally expected to complete the works and is liable for it. And so, um, and then when they've done that, they can apply to get a refund back from the, 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 um, the, the central fund. All right, so I think it's sort of partially along that model, but it doesn't deal with this issue of long-term monitoring. So. Uh, we know we can do it. I mean, as Richard said, there's the super fund example. The Northern Territory has the Mining Legacy Fund, which is a 1% levy on uh, uh, existing mines in the Northern Territory to help fund uh, the, the remediation of abandoned mines. Uh, and as part of that, there is, a, you know, I suppose, a basis on which they can use some of that money for, uh, for long-term monitoring as well. But um, we need a higher level approach. And I think one of the things that you know, I've made the point many times, I guess, that if we did that in Australia, let's say we've got 0.01% uh, of um, you know, mining revenue in Australia, is there's a, that's the levy we put on that. Um, and I think, if I get my maths correct, we'd probably be looking at something of you know, $100 million of, you know, alone in one year just from that levy that we would have. Uh, and so uh, there are ideas out there. There are ways we can do that. I guess this is part of the... The conversation that we need to have to work out what is the best way to do that um, and understand that yeah there is a cost but there's also great benefit both scientifically as well as with social license to operate um, as well as actually making sure that we address the real liabilities so so i think there's a you know the reward for effort ratio there i, I certainly believe is is strong um, but we need to work out how to make sure that the, the arrangements um you know are equitable for, for all concerned 
Richard, uh, any extra thoughts? No, I think, uh, I think you've covered that one. I'm conscious we've got six questions to go and three. Go for it. <laughs> Speed answers. Let's go for it. Is Michelle there? No, Michelle may have dropped off. I'll, I'll try seeing if okay. I can get the questions I'm up. sorry. <laughs> I'm back here. So, um, Governum into organization database only cut uh, for the data that the particular organization is responsible for. How do you make one point of truth for all water related data, even when more than one organization regulator are collecting or responsible? Um, Richard, you wanna go first on that one? Yeah, look, I think um, there's plenty of examples where that has worked successfully. And I think one of the ones is where Gavin put up about the Surat Basin around coal sand gas monitoring, and that's, that's one that HydroTerra was involved in. Um, there's multiple parties collecting that data in a continuous way, and it's all going back to a centralised repository, which is independently run. The, the key to this is provenance of data and mapping that through, and that's something that I spend way too much time in my life doing, which is you, you really need to be able to look at integrity of data that's produced. And that means you need to have integrity of the methods that sit behind that. And then you need to have ways of ensuring and, and proving that that is actually the way you collect your data. And the best way to do that is to systemize that. It doesn't mean it's all automated, but it means that the processes that are used to collect that data are consistent and you have lines of evidence to show that it's been proven. Now, most of the industry operates in that way at the moment, but the systems aren't very elegant and efficient. But the uh, Office of Groundwater Impact Assessments um, processes up there in, um, in Queensland were successful and it really did lever off having... Um, automation of bringing that data feed back into that centralized database and approval of the methods behind which that data is collected. I think this is an area that industry really does need to focus on. There is a gap in the QAQC integrity, say between laboratory analysis versus sensor-based collection, and there's differences in the quality of that data. So the accuracy, for example, but that needs to be balanced against the variability that comes from dynamic systems too. So a lab analysis is only accurate to the data it's collected where sensor data picks up the dynamic characteristics. So there's a lot of thought required in that, but I think the answer to the question is really, there needs to be agreement on methodologies and there needs to be agreement on data analysis processes, post measurement, and both are equally important. So that would really make industry standards around that is, is what yeah, we're Absolutely, Richard. I think we already do pretty much that for contaminated site staff and a lot of statutory monitoring anyway. So I think a lot of that is just basically using the same methods that we already have. Um, but again, just making sure they're, they're included in the way that we do this for mine rehabilitation. Absolutely. In the meantime, I've just been typing a few sort of short answers to some of these sort of questions there. So um, yeah, so hopefully that helps with some of the other questions. But um, Michelle, do you want to go? Yes, okay. Next one, Tony Reed from Ranger Mine. Do you have any good white papers on placing geotextile subaqueously through several meters of water and anchoring to a pit wall? Also, stitching geotextile on water. Our pit through water is pH 3. Yeah, that's a really difficult context. And I, I think. Um, there are examples out there. I can, and sometimes you do hit the, the real limits of some of this sort of stuff. There are examples in Germany. There's, um, you know, in Ranger, um, I think the, a lot of the work they've done is putting waste rock over the top first. So you get the um, loading to basically um, compact the surface down and make it more stable to be able to start traffic on. Um, so I think, yeah, email me. I've just typed that into the response now. So if you, if you email me, I can, um, I can provide some more papers either on the experience at Ranger and also the um, experience elsewhere around um, Germany and so on, or at least point to where, where to find that literature. 
and it may or may not be able to be exactly that specific to health, but uh, hopefully that gets you a long way. Thank you, Julie Board. Also, um, thank you for answering Michael's query. It's related. Um, any other suggestion for measuring success of a rehabbed waste rock dump? Dump. Sorry. Yeah, I think I mean, I'd briefly sort of say I'd revert back to sort of what I was explaining earlier. I think a lot of them um, are exactly the same. We're looking at the ecological structure on a waste rock dump. Um, you know, we, we see, like, there's an old tailing stand at Malden in central Victoria, which is a, a tailing stand, not a waste rock dump, uh, but it had been there for probably a century now, and it's all fully rehabilitated or revegetated, I should say, um, at least to, visually to a standard that looks pretty similar to the surrounding uh, uh, bush. All right? And so, and when that was proposed for reprocessing back in the 90s, the local community said no, and so the company had to abandon that project. And so, uh, so I think that a lot of the common ways we would think about it are exactly the way a lot of um, communities approach it as well. There are metrics we can look at for the revegetation and the structure. So then there's also physical stability. Are there risks of acid mine drainage or, or not? Um, and so, so a lot of that, I think they're, they're all the various metrics we look at. Um, so, but again, and the, the, the actual um, criteria you might set for judging success may vary. Um, if you're looking at um, the coal mine, so especially the Anglesey coal mine, which is uh, uh, nearing the end of its rehabilitation now, I understand, um, the criteria they use there would probably be quite different to the criteria in the Latrobe Valley. All right, so with Anglesey, they're probably looking at heathland re-establishment um, as part of the ecological values next to the, um, the Great Ocean Road and the, um, you know, the beaches and stuff there, versus the Latrobe Valley, where you might quite happily allow um, grazing. All right, so I think the, yeah, so all of that will be very site specific. Okay, thank you. Last one from Joe Oldenkrantz. Do you anticipate any PFAS monitoring requirements in and around these mines? Uh, thanks for asking that, Joe. <laughs> um, yes, um, and what would they find? Uh, who knows? Um, it's something that I think it's, it's a, a, a big Pandora's box at the moment that I don't think we know what the size of that is. But um, and I, there are some sites where you wouldn't expect to find PFAS and there's probably others where you might find it without expecting to find it. And there's probably some where you will find it when you actually do expect to find it as well. So I think you, you'll probably see that full range there. But um, yeah, I think that the main PFAS focus at the moment are things like airports and firefighting facilities and landfills and so on. But it's, uh, yeah, it's something that I think people have thought about from the lines, but it's, um, haven't seen much on that yet, but it's probably something that we do need to think about. But beyond that, I think it's a it's a, it's a great question uh, and doesn't really have a great answer at the moment, except to say that yes, it's something that we need to look at. Okay, that's all questions for now. I would uh, take the time to um, say thank you to Gavin and Richard for the time to present this webinar, really um, informative. So anything else to add? Gavin and Richard. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, I hope it's been really useful for people to think about um, the types of ideas and technologies and the, and the sort of, I suppose, the targets that we need to, and the systems we need to think about to um, achieve good mine rehabilitation success. And, and I'd probably like to say thank you very much, Gavin. Um, the other thing I'd say is that one of the key messages Gavin was hoping to get through today was that Technology is not the limiter on how we manage these sites these days. It's more the adoption of that technology uh, to coming up with better ways. And hopefully uh, today, which was our first one of this style of webinar to promote that sort of thinking, I hope that's been of value to everyone. And thank you very much. We had lots of participants today, and I think that's uh, reflective of um, Gavin's knowledge and value. But thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. See you in the next webinar. Okay. See you later, folks. Sure. Yeah. Bye.